Today is the first day of our last week of school. How many of you are ready for your next grade? All hands up. Let's give each one of you a hand of applause. Congratulations. We're at Spring Valley School. It's the oldest public school in California. It was established in 1852. And what is very ironic about me being the principal here is that were I alive that, at that time in the 1800s, I could not walk into the school at all. Spring Valley has a notoriety mainly because Chinese could not come to this school at all. In 1884, there was a family by the name of Tape, a man, Joseph, his wife, Mary, they wanted to enroll their daughter, Mamie, to this school. And she was about eight years old, and um, she was born here in San Francisco and lived just down the street. But they were not allowed to come to the school. The Tate family went to court, and their case is called Tate versus Hurley. Eight-year-old Mamie Tate seeking admission to her neighborhood school versus Jenny Hurley, principal of this school, Spring Valley in San Francisco, in 1885. The principal was ordered by the San Francisco Board of Education to deny admission to any child described as Mongolian, one of several changing racial names given to people from Asia. This Mongolian label was used to exclude not only Chinese, but later to keep out Filipinos, Japanese, Koreans, and Asian Indians. As each Asian group arrived, they were treated as if they were the same. From the beginning of their arrival in Gold Rush, California, 30 years before the Mamie Tape case, the Chinese were already trying to attend the public schools. They argued against unequal treatment. Chinese workers and merchants pay taxes and make possible the very schools denied to them. They petition and petition to no avail. A few night classes now and then, and some classes offered by churches, but no normal, regular public schooling. Looking to the future, the community had already laid the groundwork for Mamie Tate with the case of another Chinese youth born in California, Lok Tin Singh. In 1884, the U.S. Circuit Court considered his case. Could he visit China for a few years and still have the right to return to the U.S. as an American citizen? The Port Authority said no and would not let him disembark the ship. But Luk Tin Singh won his case, affirming citizenship by right of native birth. And that was a green light for Mamie Tape's assertion later the same year that as an American citizen by right of birth, she was entitled to a public school education. Judge James McGuire of the Superior Court agreed with the Chinese community and summoned the school authorities to show cause why this American-born child should not be admitted to the public schools. He ordered that Mamie Tate be admitted and the principal, Jenny Hurley, would be in contempt of court if she stood in the way. Now, she was the one who barred Mamie from coming to Spring Valley School. The principal was told at that time by the Board of Education that she would be fired if she enrolled Mamie Tate. And so she gave the excuse that she didn't have a certificate of, you know, inoculations, nor um, were the, was there room for them because every class had more than 60 students and their limit was 60 students per class. So the family decided anyway that they had a right to come to Spring Valley School and they filed a suit. The city superior court as well as the state supreme court agreed with them. However, the Board of Education had such anti-Chinese feeling that they decided that no way were they going to accept any Chinese students 
because they felt that they were vicious liars and they were filthy and that they would then run the white students away from the school. Andrew Mulder, San Francisco Superintendent of Schools, calling the Chinese a race of liars, already anticipated the Supreme Court ruling, and he was ready. The court mandated public schooling for Mamie Tape, but did it have to be at Spring Valley School? Mulder arranged to have a new state law rush through the California legislature, Assembly Bill 268. State schools already had the power to exclude certain children because of behavior or because of infectious diseases. Assembly Bill 268 added race as another category of exclusion. For children of Mongolian or Chinese descent, new separate schools would be established. And further, Mongolian children would be allowed to go only to those schools and to no others. This meant that the California authorities, in response to the Tate family, had created an early form of school segregation enforced by law. It was a segregation that was technically legal for 70 years until finally overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1954. For Mary Tate, the Oriental School was the last straw. Her home on Green Street was not in Chinatown. Spring Valley School was her children's neighborhood school. Mrs. Tate wrote the San Francisco Board of Education a scathing letter. 1769 Green Street, San Francisco, April 8, 1885. To the Board of Education. Dear Sirs, I see that you are going to make all sorts of excuses to keep my child off of the public schools. Dear sirs, will you please tell me, is it a disgrace to be born a Chinese? Didn't God make us all? What right have you to bar my children out of the public school because she is of Chinese descent? You have expended a lot of public money foolishly, all because of one poor little child. Why didn't you let her attend the school nearest her home instead of first making one pretense, then another pretense of some kind, to keep her out. May you, Mr. Mulder, never be persecuted like the way you have persecuted little Mamie Tate. I will let the world see, sir, what justice there is when it is governed by race prejudiced men. Mrs. M. Tate. Who was Mrs. M. Tate? This Chinese woman of the 19th century challenging the authorities in a manner so personal and unafraid. We wouldn't know much about her were it not for the fact that Mary Tate was also an artist. A 19th century catalog recording the names of artists showing their works at an annual exhibition includes the name of Mary Tate in several places. A college art curator discovered her name while planning an exhibition of early Asian American artists. The curator thought if she could just find someone who had one of Mary Tate's paintings to lend, probably a relative. The exhibition was mounted and looking for a painting by Mary Tate they ended up finding a network of relatives. The exhibition itself brought some of the relatives together, from the Joseph and Mary Tate family and by marriage, the Kim family. Some relatives were meeting for the first time. Virtually none knew anything about Mary or Mamie Tate's connection to the case of Tate versus Hurley. Certainly none of them had ever heard this history in a classroom. Mary Tate was my great-grandmother, and her daughter was Mamie Tate, and then my mother was her daughter, uh, Emily Lowell. That's my This is my husband, Bill, and it's his aunt, Ruby, who married Frank Tate, who is the son of Mary Tate. And that's the connection here. 
she was a calligrapher, a photographer, and an artist. And we had this painting of the family for, well, I can remember, in my grandmother's home. And then it was passed along to my grandmother, to my mother, my mother, to my mother-in-law, and my mother-in-law back to my daughter. I remember Mamie. She was quite a remarkable lady. She was really... Um, Modern. Very modern. She, you know, just kept right up with it all the time. She always knew what was going on and she could always talk to us kids. Mary Tape is a beautiful artist that did some dishes that I passed on to my daughters. Hand painted dishes. She painted beautiful um, china. The dishes that I have are mainly blue and they have flowers painted on them and then there's gold, like gold painted around the edges. So that's a set of dishes that I have that was painted by Mary Tate. The Tate family were very uh, outgoing people and they had a, a lot of pride and I don't think that it would be surprising to me or to a lot of Chinese families that they did what they did. I felt the same way when I was in Marysville because in Marysville, why uh, we were always considered as second class citizens. The higher class people came down and uh, uh, treated us like dirt. And uh, I resented that. And I always felt that I had to fight for everything I could get, and I did just that. And I think most Chinese people feel the same way. The larger significance of Tate versus Hurley is its place in the legacy of legal struggles for equality. Mamie Tate's case was in 1885. The authorities treated segregated schools as if they were equal, or at least equal enough for groups considered inferior. Ten years later, in 1896, we have the U.S. Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson in Louisiana. Homer Plessy, was a 30-year-old shoemaker who was arrested for sitting in the whites-only section of a railroad car and refusing to move. Homer Plessy was 7 eighths white and only 1 eighth black, but in the drawing of him sitting in top hat, being challenged by a railroad clerk, his face is rendered very dark. Plessy pursued his struggle through every legal level ending in the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled that separate could be equal if the facilities are approximately the same. A legal precedent was set that separate facilities for black and whites were constitutional as long as they were equal. This separate but equal doctrine was quickly extended to cover broad areas of public life, allowing for the practice of racial segregation in restaurants, theaters, restrooms, and the public schools. Not until 1954, in the Supreme Court case of Brown versus the Board of Education, was separate but equal finally struck down. Brown was Linda Brown of Topeka, Kansas, a third grader. She, too, was eight years old, just like Mamie Tate. Linda Brown's parents wanted her to have the right to attend the white school close to their home instead of having their eight-year-old walk a mile across railroad yards to attend a black school. The lawyer for Linda Brown was Thurgood Marshall, then NAACP chief counsel, and later justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. The case of Brown versus the board was joined by similar challenges in three other states, in Virginia, Delaware, and South Carolina. In 1954, Linda Brown won her case when the Supreme Court ruled that separate is not equal and further, 
mandated desegregation in the public schools. The diversity of children we see at Spring Valley School today is a direct legacy of the struggle for the rights of Linda Brown. You know, I think a lot of kids find it astounding because most of us understand the, the civil rights movement as has been experienced by African Americans. And it's through the African Amer American experience that we understand how specific ethnic groups have been severely limited in their civil rights. Kids may not understand. They need to understand what took place at a certain time and place. But with regard to knowing the feeling, I mean, to bring it down to kid level, I think we can understand if somebody treats us badly, we know how that feels. My job as principal is to welcome all the students that come to us. Spanish speakers, Chinese speakers, people who are African American, people who are Bosnians. Filipinos, students who are East Indian. And so you can tell that our students represent the globe. Here in the 1990s, we still have children who will come up to me. These are Chinese speaking children who will ask me, Ms. Chin, are you really Chinese? For some reason, unconsciously, they cannot make the connection between a person who is Chinese having a position of power. And this is the connection that's interesting. Another example has to do with African American children or white children who might say to me, you know, are you Chinese? In fact, there are some kids who have said to me in a moment of anger, I don't have to do what you tell me, you honky. And so that tells me that children seem to think that people who have power normally and naturally have to be Caucasian or Anglo. And that's why it's so important to have role models in situations where the children can actually see that people like them can do anything that they want. I ask you to think over and evaluate your work. Did you look at your reading? Yeah. Did you look at your writing? Yeah. Did you look at your science work? Yeah. And did you look at your stories and social studies? Yeah. Did you look at your artwork? Yeah. All right, could you tell that you improved from last September till now? Okay. From room 21, John Miller. John Miller. Here's John. <laughs> and from room 15, Julie Liang. Here's Julie. I think we have the best school in town. Principally because we believe all of our children are bright and they're capable of becoming very intelligent human beings who can, whose future can be bright and they will contribute to the community wherever they're going to be. I, I truly expect one of our students to become mayor of San Francisco one day. <laughs>